Imagine you're an early human sitting in your cave, minding your own business, and you hear a very loud and unfamiliar noise. You walk outside and you see this. Lightning has hit a tree and has started a fire. But you don't know what a fire is. This is the first time that you have seen it. You have two choices. You could give in to the fear and run away from it, or you could get close to examine it and experiment. Maybe throw something in it and see what happens. Maybe pour water on it and see what happens. And eventually, the curiosity conquered the fear and humans started to learn and harness the fire. And that was a game changer. Humans used fire to protect against cold, predators, and darkness. And also to cook food, which helped us access new sources of proteins, which helped develop our brain. Fire also changed humans' sleep cycle. You see, before fire, they would just go to sleep after dark. But with fire, they would gather around campfires, and that created a new space for socialization, which then in turn helped develop language and culture. Sharing campfire stories and maybe some dance moves that were passed down from one generation to the other. This observance, experimentation, and harvesting of fire has shaped who we are as humans and our relationship with the climate and nature, all because we decided to experiment. Since then and throughout history, we have always decided to experiment. We have fueled on the curiosity about the unknowns to unlock new opportunities that has allowed us to thrive. We have harnessed and used nature to thrive in pursuit of comfort and survival. We have harnessed steam, oil and gas, and electrons to bring about industrial revolutions that has helped us to, to tame the harsh environment around us, become the dominant species on Earth, and create the comfortable lives that we enjoy today in developed countries. But there is a problem. Not everyone lives in developed countries. And despite all this success, there are still over 1 billion people with no access to electricity, and 3 billion people with no access to clean fuel, even for cooking at home. And these people are being asked not to use fuels that create emissions, because the rest of us in developed countries have already overconsumed our share of the global carbon emission budget. You know what that's like? Imagine if you and your roommates get a pizza, but they get to it first. They eat it all, and by the time you get home, they're full, you know, chilling on the couch, watching Netflix. You're hungry, but they tell you, you cannot have the slice that's left because carbs aren't good for us. On the other side of the spectrum, in developed countries, we're using too much energy and we're creating so much emissions. And the solution has been to decarbonize and go through energy transition and electrify. And that has created a whole new set of issues that we were not even prepared for. We still live in a world where kids in Congo are digging up cobalt by hand because we want more electronic vehicles faster. Metals like cobalt, lithium, other critical minerals, rare earth metals are essential for energy transition. So how could we minimize the impact of mining? And this is both environmental and social impacts. We want to move quickly and achieve energy transition, but the way we're going about sustainability is not sustainable. We're asking too much of nature too quickly. Basically, we're having relationship problems with nature. I think we need a timeout, and we need to go to therapy to figure this out. 
When you, when you see the, the wildfires, the tsunamis, the hurricanes, this is nature telling us we need to talk. And despite what Elon Musk tells you, I don't think Mars is a good plan B. And it also seems to be very high maintenance. So where do we go from here? This energy conundrum seems hopeless and unfair. Yet again, like the caveman, we have a choice to make. We could either, either give in to the fear and despair, or we could choose to experiment. I say, let's experiment. We could again look at nature to observe, experiment, and harness, and create a new framework that could help us mitigate the current effects of climate change, but also create new sustainable industries for the future generation. Today, I'm excited to share with you my vision for this framework, the surprising place where we have found the solution in nature, and also some very tangible examples. So let's start with the framework. I believe sustainable industries of the future should be based on three pillars. The first one is sustainable recovery of natural resources whether that natural resource is hydrocarbons in the subsurface or if it's minerals in a mine. Companies that touch any kind of natural resource will have to reduce their carbon footprint, but also their environmental footprint. They have to go from extractive practices to regenerative practices. And especially, I want to call out all oil and gas companies and mining companies who have to start to adopt and be in the forefront of these regenerative practices. Second, these sustainable industries of the future will have to have new methods of production that are low carbon and waste free. Currently, we're using too much energy for production. That needs to change. This also addresses scope one emissions, which is related to the energy use for production. The way to think about it is, if your house is insulated, you would need less energy, whether that energy is from fossil fuels or renewables. We have to start with using less energy for production. And finally, these industries of the future will have to use any kind of waste that's created within the recovery and production and be able to use it as a feedstock and convert it into other useful materials to close the loop, both on carbon and also on waste. Why is this important? Because we're going to have a feedstock problem. If we don't want to use fossil fuels, we're left with what is known as biomass, sugar, corn, other crops that are used as biomass to make chemicals. But those also come with other problems, fertilizer use, water use, land use, emissions due to transportation. So what are we left with? And this is where waste could be viewed as a valuable feeder stock, which in turn helps close the carbon loop. To summarize, we need to use less energy to make stuff. And if we learn to reuse the old stuff, we need less new stuff. That's regenerative and circular economy. For the past five years, my team and I a group of passionate scientists and engineers at Samvita have been observing, experimenting, and harnessing nature to develop solutions that enable this framework to empower the energy transition. And the place where we have found the surprising solution is microbes. Now, you may not realize, but you're probably already a big fan of microbes because it's microbes that turns sugar into alcohol. <laughs> but did you know, there are also other microbes that could produce energy, that could eat CO2 as food and turn it into other chemicals, that could break metals from rock and extract them efficiently. These microbes are robust and they're sustainable. How do I know? They've been around for the past 3.7 billion years. That's the definition of sustainability. And we're just starting 
to learn about the amazing capabilities of these microbes. Now with this cost drop in DNA sequencing, we have the tools to better observe these microbes. And with the recent advancements in synthetic biology, like CRISPR, directed evolution, we could better experiment with these microbes. And finally, with bioprocessing technology, we could harness these microbes to develop solutions that could unlock new possibilities for reducing our carbon and environmental footprint to a rate that is sustainable. What does this look like? Let me show you some examples. Biomining of lithium. Currently, the mining industry uses sulfuric acid to extract lithium. Sulfuric acid is very corrosive, and this process is very destructive by design. What sulfuric acid does, it, it rips out the lithium, but also it brings out all these other impurities, which then you have to get rid of to get to the lithium, and that makes the process inefficient. Also, the ex excessive use of acid by itself is also not exactly environmentally friendly. At Sambita, we have created a new process for bioextraction of lithium using microbes. Our microbes and the organic acids that they produce are very selective to lithium, and they leave other impurities behind, like calcium and magnesium. More efficiency, less environmental footprint. Why is this important? We're going to need a lot of lithium if you want to achieve energy transition and net zero. Each EV uses about 10 kilograms of lithium. And International Energy Agency is telling us we need 2 billion EVs by 2050 to achieve net zero. That's a very big number. And I don't even know if we could get close to that. But even if you want to achieve a portion of it, that means we're going to need a lot more lithium. This method gives us a, a way to respond to this increasing demand for lithium in a sustainable manner. Biomanufacturing of zero carbon and even carbon negative fuels. Today, we rely on fossil fuels to make fuels. In some cases, we could get rid of that. For example, if you have an EV and you charge it using renewable energy, you don't need fossil fuels. In other cases, it's really hard to do. That's what we call hard to abate sectors. Let's look at aviation as an example. Airline industry is going through a massive transformation to decarbonize. And the best and safest way they found to do that is by replacing traditional jet fuel with sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF. SAF has an ability, which is really impressive, to bring about about 80% reduction in emissions by replacing traditional jet fuel. In collaboration with United Airlines, we have a project where we are using microbes that could eat CO2 as their feeder stock and produce SAF. This SAF could have the lowest carbon and environmental footprint possible. As far as biomanufacturing, if you think about it, in today's refineries, we're using petroleum as a feeder stock, and then we turn that into fuels, and the process also creates emissions. In the biomanufacturing facilities of the future, you could use CO2 as a feeder stock and produce fuels that are low carbon, zero carbon, or even carbon negative. And finally, hydrogen. Hydrogen is the holy grail of all fuels. Why? Because it doesn't create emissions when you burn it. And it also has such great energy density. Compared to natural gas, if you burn one pound of hydrogen, you get about two and a half times more energy. So you may ask, well, then how come we're not using so much more hydrogen today? It's because the current method 
for producing hydrogen, which is esteem methane reforming, uses methane as a feedstock, and it also creates emissions. And the green methods, such as green hydrogen, are still expensive. We have created a completely new way to produce hydrogen using microbes in the subsurface that eat the unrecovered oil and gas from depleted reservoirs in abandoned oil fields and turn that into hydrogen, what we call gold hydrogen, at a cost of less than a dollar per kilogram. This will help enable a foundation for the growth of the hydrogen economy. These were just three quick examples, but we're just scratching the surface with what's possible with bioeconomy. This is a future made possible by experimentation. Throughout history, we have observed, experimented, and harnessed the power of nature. But we've had a one-sided and extractive relationship with nature. That needs to change. We need to establish a relationship that is balanced, that is regenerative, and that is sustainable with nature. Because everyone deserves to have a slice of low-carb pizza. <laughs> and humanity, we have a decision to make. We're the smartest species on Earth, but with that, we have a huge responsibility. We need to develop solutions that don't optimize just for the about 8 billion people on Earth today, but also for future generations and other species. I think fundamentally that is what makes us human, the ability to have empathy for future generations and other species as well. So I say, Let's experiment. Thank you. <laughs>